Babood, thank you very much for the, the kind introduction. A lot of friends in the audience. I promise to show you more sports slides than you've ever seen in any other uh, Grand Rounds. I started off with a little bit of a, a quote, as you saw, under raging controversies, plus shans, and that means the more things change, and many of you may recognize here Gray's anatomy, looks a little, um, some of the characters are still the same, but I'm going to try to tell you a few stories, and no matter what part of cardiology you're involved in, I think you'll enjoy these stories and lessons learned over the years. So our objectives are to review the rationale and evolution of the risk assessment and prevention guidelines. We'll talk about our ABCDE approach, and we'll look at that evidence supporting a more aggressive medical and especially a lifestyle management of cardiovascular disease. A little bit of history. Our center is named after a person who was a really close friend of mine, a dynamic gentleman, a great coach, Henry Ciccaroni, sort of a mix of uh, Coach K, Dean Smith, Jim, and John Harbaugh, uh, someone who I admired very much. But unfortunately, he died after his third heart attack at the age of uh, 50. And uh, fortunately, I was able to get a lot of his former players and friends in the business community to pledge the seed money for what's become a, a really uh, uh, outstanding translational research and clinical center. Here's a picture of Coach Ciccaroni from Sports Illustrated, very intense. The guy uh, uh, leaning down there, and that's our original uh, brochure uh, more than uh, three decades ago. And fast forward about 32 years ahead, that's my son, number 32, Ross uh, Blumenthal, playing goalie in the NCAA tournament against Notre Dame. And uh, clearly lacrosse and sports has played a big role in my family's life. And this was a really cool play I just thought I'd show you. Notre Dame shooter right on the crease, and my son's going to make a kick save with his right leg. I probably jumped about 12 feet in the air when he did that in the NCAA tournament. So uh, a little bit of sports for you. So what is the, the Chikaroni Center? We consider ourselves a diverse group of clinicians and researchers, not just interested in prevention of heart attacks, but also heart failure and atrial fibrillation, a big focus on clinical care, education, research, scholarship, and mentorship, and one of our stars is here in the, the second row, Dr. Coram Nasser, who is really a, a, one of the, the greatest people ever in the prevention community. And so you're very uh, fortunate to have him here in Houston. So we have this uh, very big group of uh, individuals and uh, Chiadi and Dumoulin, um has uh, taken the lead on this uh, new um, CKM initiative. And we'll talk about that and the prevent score. So there's a lot of new things that I'll try to update you about. Now, I've been, uh, you know, I've been said that, you know, great coach, uh, very successful, but to have a, be a, the coach, you got to have superstars like Coram Nasser, Mike Blaha, Seth Martin, Aaron Mikos, and that's been our success. We've been able to uh, keep working with a lot of our trainees. So here's a, a little uh, a key slide from 2000. Hard to believe that. That's uh, yours truly. Henry, Harry Belafonte, who just recently passed away at age 96, and that's Levi Watkins, the great cardiac surgeon who put the first defibrillator uh, in at, at, at Hopkins. And uh, I got to uh, see uh, Mr. Belafonte for a second opinion uh, back in 19, uh, uh, in, I guess it was 2000, uh, it was 1997. I forgot about when I got married. It was just a few weeks before. And uh, there's a picture of Spike Lee when, uh, showing a, a, a Harry Belafonte when he passed away. And hopefully we'll be able to uh, tie this all together with Spike Lee and Mr. Belafonte at the end. But let's um, update you. What are the different types of prevention? There's primordial, prevent the risk factors, primary, modify those risk factors to prevent an initial event. And what most of us in this room have been trained to do, try to reduce recurrent events. Always like the little cartoon Whenever your cholesterol gets too high, a sensor will send out a signal that automatically locks the kitchen door, turns on your treadmill. Be nice if some of the mechanical folks here at Texas Heart can come up with that. Well, let me uh, introduce to you the, the, this ABC approach that was really, I have to give credit to Ray Gibbons. He came up with the ABC approach for angina, aspirin, antiangels, beta blocker, blood pressure. And I thought this is really a good way to teach our Hopkins residents about. And, um, and I thought to myself, Michael Jackson, ABC, simple as one, two, three. This is the way we're going to get those Hopkins residents to understand everything there is to know. So let's go through this. When I presented the, the primary prevention guidelines, this is what uh, we, we use. So A for assess risk. PCE is pool cohort equation first. 
Now we're going to talk more about the prevent score in a little bit, but you can personalize with certain uh, factors. You can refine by coronary calcium and also ask about adverse pregnancy outcomes. A for antiplatelet therapy. We said we needed to rethink aspirin. No longer did every man 55 or woman 60 need to go on aspirin. B stands for blood pressure. We said 120 is the new 140. That's really the optimal blood pressure, less than 120. Lifestyle modification first. High risk ad medicines at 130 over 80. Lower risk will tolerate up to 140 over 90. C stands for cholesterol. Clearly statins are where the, uh, the data is. We can refine by coronary calcium. And thanks to people like Dr. Nasser here, the power of zero plays a, a key role in risk assessment. C stands for uh, cigarettes, never too late to quit. Motivational interviews first and pharmacotherapy next. And then uh, D for diabetes, screen for diabetes, lifestyle modification for all. But in addition to metformin, we have all these new medications that are so helpful in the cardiology realm, SGLT2 inhibitors, GLP-1 receptor agonists, and diet, pescatarian, Mediterranean, flexitarian. Those are the key issues. And then a little bit of humor for you in terms of diet. I just thought I'd introduce you to Joey Chestnut there. Uh, many of you uh, hear his name July 4th. 62 hot dogs, that's 17,000 calories. And then the great one, uh, Wayne Gretzky, his pregame meal was four hot dogs with onions, pizza, slice of cake, and two Diet Cokes for every game. So, so dietary changes, you know, might be uh, work for some people, not for all. And then E stands for exercise. Now, when we talk about 150 minutes, that's of moderate, that's the minimum. What you want to get across to your patients is the more you do, the better and M health tools for activity tracking, E for make exercise a vital sign. And then they added in life's accentuate sleep. Now, if you're like me, uh, clinicians don't do too well with sleep. So we're never gonna do too uh, well with, with that, but that's part of uh, the life's accentuate. And then I thought I'd put an F for family history. Those who are too young to remember the Sopranos, you should go back and look at some of those episodes. Family and family history is so important in, in cardiology disease. A shout out here to Salim Varani. So Salim led uh, our chronic coronary disease guidelines and he did such a great job. And some of the key points with the STARS, avoid triple therapy, um, you know, maybe drop aspirin, use clopidogrel and uh, an anticoagulant, um, B for beta blockers, maintain for one year after an ACS or MI, but after that, the data is not that strong much more aggressive uh, attack towards aggressive uh, lipid lowering therapy and a greater emphasis on SGLT2 inhibitors. And then F for failure and G GDMT evaluate the pillars of including an SGLT2 inhibitor are so important. Well, Dr. Nasser is right here. And I, I thought I had to show this great editorial you had there, Quorum. I love this quote from John F. Kennedy, the time to repair the roof is when the sun is shining. And that's what we need to remember. If we're in pretty good health now, we need to think about how we're going to try to uh, emphasize prevention. And I want to just give you a, a brief taste of what the new part of the American Heart Association emphasis is, this CKM, so uh, uh, cardiovascular kidney metabolic. It's the interplay of excess or dysfunctional adiposity, kidney dysfunction, and cardiovascular disease. We know that the higher prevalence of obesity and Glucose intolerance and diabetes leads to uh, poor cardiovascular health. And the early identification of individuals on this spectrum can help us guide protective pharmacotherapy and prevent progression to more advanced disease. And I want to give tribute to my good friend Chiadi and Dumoulin. Chiadi grew up the ultimate New York Knicks fan. And at, at a dinner after the AHA, since Chiadi was the star, I gave him this shirt that he has his hero, Patrick Ewing, on there. And those of you who are Yankee fans may uh, notice there's Derek Jeter, number two, and LT. And there's a picture of, uh, of, uh, of Patrick Ewing with that uh, same shirt later. So Chatty and Dumoulin is the latest in our series of superstars from uh, Baltimore. And one slide sort of uh, talks about this whole uh, new paradigm where stage zero, and hopefully all of us in this room are in stage zero, where we don't have any risk factors. We want to uh, preserve cardiovascular health. Stage one talks about the effects of being overweight. Stage two refers to hypertension, metabolic syndrome. Stage three, where again, Dr. Nasser, Dr. Blaha, Dr. Budoff, and others have led us with what we've learned about 
subclinical atherosclerosis, but also diastolic dysfunction, subclinical heart failure. And then stage four is what most of us have been trained to deal with, heart attacks, heart failure, PAD, stroke, and atrial fibrillation. So here's a, a nice slide of uh, Dr. Donna Arnett, myself, and, and Dr. Aaron Mikos. Aaron was our de facto uh, vice chair of the prevention guidelines, and, and that's what we tried to gear our ABC approach to. And we started off with A for assessment of risk, and we emphasized shared decision-making. No longer are we telling patients what they have to do. We want to uh, try to educate them. They make the final decision, but we can guide them, and we want to incorporate nurses, nurse practitioners, pharmacists into this uh, whole process. So in terms of the social determinants of health, we emphasize this five domain screening tool that I think all of us really should document and probably um, we're gonna be required to do so for re full reimbursement. You wanna ask your patients, do they have safe housing? Are they able to get healthy food? Do they have trouble with transportation? Can they pay for their uh, air condition, their heat? And do they have a safe place to walk, to uh, live? These are the key things, and we'll come back to the social determinants of health at the end. I wanted to show this slide. So the young people in the audience, you may not remember Ralph Sampson. Ralph Sampson played for the Rockets. He's a Hall of Fame player. And this picture was uh, taken back in the mid 80s. This is before we had the first Framingham risk score to give you an idea. And a lot of us in this room remember Patrick Ewing, a young Patrick Ewing, and Ralph Sampson very well. But this came out, uh, this picture was taken way before we had the first Framingham risk score. And then fast forward to 2013, where we had what we termed the pool cohort equation. Traditional risk factors, but I've always loved the cartoon where the clinician tells the patient, you're 57 years old, I'd like to get that down a bit. Now we haven't figured out how to do that, but as Dr. Nasser and I published a lot of things together, if you're a man less than 50, you're not gonna get to that borderline or intermediate risk unless you smoke or have diabetes. If you're a woman less than 60, you're not gonna qualify for some proven pharmacotherapy. And you're not probably gonna be motivated to make the sustained lifestyle improvements. When I presented the cholesterol guidelines in Chicago in 2018, I used the slide that risk estimation begins the risk discussion, but a, a high risk estimate doesn't mean an automatic statin treatment. There's gonna be some patients that are gonna say, doc, I, you know, give me six months. I can really make some good lifestyle changes. So what do you need to remember about assessment of risks? Well, A for the ASCVD risk estimator, we say it's a class one indication for the pooled cohort equation. I gave it a, a class 2B for the 30 year risk, but in this uh, new um, prevent equation, we have a greater emphasis on 30 year risk and lifetime risk. We have these risk enhancing factors like family history, metabolic syndrome. And then we gave, uh, we elevated the calcium score from a 2B to a 2A and that really changed a lot. And here's a picture of Dr. Nasser, uh, flew in from uh, Houston to celebrate Mike Blaha in the middle's uh, professorship, uh, uh, advancement to professor in, in record time. And uh, it was a pleasure to work with Quorum and Mike and through a lot of this data. And um, for those of you with a little bit of it and need a little bit of introduction, coronary artery calcification, you can think of almost like bone growth in the, the heart arteries. And here's a picture of a lot of this white calcification, the LAD, LAD diagonal and circumflex. And if you go back to one of our early MESA studies, if you had a calcium score of 300 or higher, you had 10 times the heart attack risk of someone the same age and risk factors who had a calcium score of zero. So the most potent uh, predictor that we had for many years was this coronary artery calcium score. And a lot of you are football fans. You probably watch the Super Bowl. They always have a coin toss. And what we now know, thanks to Quorum's work, is that if you're in that broad 5 to 20% 10-year risk, half of those people are going to have no coronary calcium. So the ASCVD risk score is no better than a flip of the coin in half of the individuals. So when we talk about power of zero, we say a coronary calcium is the best tiebreaker if there's uncertainty about how aggressive to be. We can identify a very low risk group if they have no or minimal coronary calcium. It's a decision aid and not a screening tool for everybody. And we can focus the treatment on those who are gonna benefit the most. Now, one of my good friends is up in Boston, Paul Ricker. 
And Paul has never really bought into the coronary calcium thing. He's a CRP kind of, kind of guy. And he and another good friend of mine, Rita Redberg, have really tried to minimize the impact of atherosclerosis imaging. And this was an interesting commentary that Paul did for Rita's journal. And the question was, so a low CAC score does not rule out atherosclerosis? And Dr. Ridker says, correct. Atherosclerosis is typically present decades before it can be detected by coronary calcium. That's why I counsel my patients on lifetime risk and tell them to start prevention early, not late. And I think all of us, whether we're internist or cardiologists, we always want to start prevention. But the CRP really is, is very almost worthless in trying to predict who's going to have a heart attack or stroke when you compare it to uh, atherosclerosis imaging. And here's a picture of a young Paul Ritker when he had a lot of hair, put down a young tennis enthusiast with a fondness for CRP. He was looking at a post hoc analysis of the AFCAPS TEXCAPS study. In that study, lovastatin seemed to cut the event rates from 5% to 3% in those with CRPs above two. And it says average LDL levels, but it was an LDL of 150. And now we would say that's pretty darn hot. Well, let me uh, introduce you to some of the controversies and we we'll might as well use the, the Twitter as an avenue. And this was about a year and a half ago when our friend Martha Galati was um, gonna be speaking at the European Society of Cardiology. And she said, lipid lowering therapy, do you believe in the power of zero? And um, this person who I never really had heard of, David Brown said, you mean power of zero outcomes data. So, um, that was a little bit surprising. I looked him up and he's written some really good things about the courage study and the ischemia trial. But David is one of those people who says, if you don't have a randomized controlled perspective study, it's not worth spending your money on. And uh, even though calcium is very predictive, he says, you know, I think there's a small benefit of giving a statin in high risk patients on primary prevention, but prefer lifestyle modification. And Someone named Aaron said, why not treat before disease progresses and harder to treat? And, and Dr. Brown's approach is because the disease is benign in the vast majority of patients. So I thought back to Coach Ciccaroni had his first heart attack at age 47, dies by age 50. He had all this disease and you know, shouldn't we be able to pick that up a, a lot earlier? And, and that was always in the back of my mind. So David Brown is more of a minimalist, as is John Mandrola who many of you have heard on, on Medscape. Now, if you look at this slide, you sort of see that if you, know, if you have a calcium score of zero, there's a big difference if you have a low risk score, low Framingham score versus a high risk score. If you had multiple risk factors, you actually had uh, three times the risk of those who had no risk factors, the calcium score is zero. And I think this is data of 15 years and um, I think it's very helpful that a lot of the, the cool work's been done with imaging. Now, Corm um, sometimes spends a, you know, a few minutes on Twitter on his typical day, and he uh, posted this about to Venk Murthy and others about, it's always good to have people with differing points of view. It's helped us on the journey. And then Venk Murthy at, at Michigan said, uh, how about SCCT, the Society for Cardiovascular CT, or one of your other groups, invites someone like me or, or John Mandrola or David Brown to give a feature talk. And then I was shocked when I saw David Brown's response. Thanks for the endorsement, Venk, but I don't really want to give a talk at a trade show masquerading as a scientific society. So I was actually at a stoplight. There was a traffic accident right in front of me. And I, I saw this and I couldn't believe he said that. And this was sort of my reaction here. This is Jamie Lee Curtis reenacting the famous shower scene that her mother, Janet Lee, did. And I had to had respond to, in a polite way to David Brown. And, um, and we'll come back to David Brown in a little bit. But, you know, Dr. Redberg masterminded uh, JAMA Internal Medicine, and they have this great impact factor. And she would continually post incorrect and misleading things about cardiac CT. And this chart here, she has down coronary calcium scan, established risk calculators are more effective at estimating the risk of a heart attack. And we know that's not true. The Framingham score and the ASCVD risk score is inferior to the ASCVD risk score. Now this one, when she includes CT angiography and coronary calcium, she said, neither test can identify specific ways to lower the 
chance of having a heart attack. Well, we actually, remember we talked about the ABCs, that's ways we can lower risk of heart attack or stroke. And she says, neither test is a proven tool for estimating the risk of a heart attack. Well, clearly that's not the case, but um, so Rita and I, a longtime friend, but disagreed about a few things over the years. And I thought I'd give you a little more humor here. It was a nice editorial that I wrote with Ronnie Hassan. It said, guidelines attempt to define practices that meet the needs of patients in most circumstances and are not a replacement for clinical judgment. Situations might arise in which deviations from these guidelines may be appropriate. So in our guidelines, it said, you know, it's an option to use a coronary calcium scan. It's not a rule. And then some of you may recognize Bill Murray here played Dr. Bankman in Ghostbusters. He said, I make it a rule never to get involved with possessed people. But then when a very uh, attractive young lady comes to seduce him, he said, actually, it's more of a guideline than a rule. So remember, these are guidelines that we were giving uh, to people. Now, our friend Don, John Mandrola has this huge following, and I, I, I agree with a lot of what he has to say, but sometimes he's misguided. He says that his patients have zero calcium score. All they do is they go out and start eating cheeseburgers every night. And for those patients with a, a high calcium score, he said that now every palpitation or period of dyspnea during exercises raises thoughts about angina or death. So he doesn't believe at all about ever using calcium as a tiebreaker. And he also says, you know, it doesn't really make sense because statins raise calcium. So, you know, it doesn't make sense to ever get a coronary calcium scan. Well, the best study actually is this paradigm study. And uh, it looked at a, a serial angiography with intravascular ultrasound and then done baseline and then four years later. And what you can see is that the amount of calcified plaque does go up some, but it's mainly stabilizing that fibrous cap but the amount of non-calcified plaque goes down uh, much more. So if you ever see Dr. Mandrola, you can maybe uh, point that out to him. Now you can take the attitude that we're all gonna get older. Some of you may recognize Matthew Broderick here and you know when he was in that uh, great show where he wanted to take a day off from uh, school and you know, turned a little bit gray there. And you could say, look at that intravascular ultrasound, this seven, 17 year old who died in a motor vehicle accident already has some plaque. So you know, it will treat everybody uh, when they're 25 or 30 with medicines, but most of our patients don't want to go on medicines that early. So sometimes we do need these tiebreakers to help. I think the real breakthrough is going to be in incidental findings of coronary calcium. Now, in this country, we order about 20 million chest CTs a year. I usually say that the Hopkins Medical House staff orders 1 million of them. And um, I don't know how uh, it is in, in Houston if you guys order as many chest CTs as we do in Baltimore. But you can actually look at many of these CT scans and determine whether it's mild, moderate, or severe coronary calcium. And that can really be a game changer for getting people into care to knowing uh, who people are already headed towards a, a bad path with uh, cardiovascular disease. And this was an editorial that I wrote with Jelani Grant and Seamus Welton about incidental coronary calcium, nothing is more expensive than a missed opportunity. And it's a great uh, chance to either use the software that can uh, quantitate the amount of calcification, these non-gated CT scans. Um, and I think it, it, uh, that's probably where the impact is going to be even more because the number of coronary calcium scans we order in this country is relatively small compared to that 20 million of the chest CTs. So I, getting back to David Brown, I, I thought I'd, I'd sort of like poke the bear a little bit. When this study came out, the reprieve study about HIV and, you know, in our cholesterol guidelines, we said patients with HIV, that's a risk enhancing factor. These people, multiple risk factors, they should have been on statins. And I posted this daily statin trial for patients with uh, HIV halted early for clear benefit. I wonder, I wonder what the response will be from the less is more enthusiasts, meaning David Brown. And he said, said enthusiasts value RCTs with hard outcomes to guide treatment, unlike our power of zero friends. So Dr. Nasser, myself, we're these power of zero uh, friends, according to David Brown. And then I was not ready to have, I just couldn't take anymore. I said, David, we probably agree 95% of the time. Pretty good considering I only agree with my wife 85% of the time. I think you understand our 
primary prevention guidelines, selective use of a CAC scan allows for more flexible treatment targets and informs patient decision-making, but clearly uh, was not going to uh, win that battle. But I think people like David Brown and Rita Redberg, even though they're super smart, like this ostrich with their head in the sand, we know what causes cardiovascular disease. We know that we can treat blood pressure, cholesterol, blood sugar better. We know we can motivate certain people. And if you ignore the prognostic power of this subclinical atherosclerosis, in my mind, you're doing your patients a grave misservice. So I'll probably never be able to agree fully with uh, David Brown, but he's really smart about some other things. So where did this power zero come from? Generally say this paper that Dr. Nasser was a senior author on with Mike Blaha that in uh, appropriately selected asymptomatic patients, the absence of coronary calcium predicts excellent survival with 10-year event rates, total mortality rates of only 1%. And these you know, people, a lot of whom were in their, their 60s, a finding of no coronary calcium might be used as a rationale to emphasize lifestyle therapies rather than jumping into multiple medicines and to forgo these repeated stress nuclear tests for $2,000 for squirrely chest pain. And that's really where the power of zero started. And here's that data from the our MESA study early on showing the blue calcium scores of 300 with event rates at five years of about 12%. And at the bottom, calcium scores of zero with uh, uh, heart attack rates of about 0.5%. So that was pretty darn striking. And it was, it was great to be able to publish that. Now, I'm a football guy. And actually, Glenn, you asked me if I was going to show any Bill Belichick slides. And I am. Here it is. So in this editorial that I did with uh, Torsten Leuker, um, it was about a great study that uh, Matt Budoff did where, you know, a calcium score of 300 or higher was associated with the same level of risk as someone who already had a heart attack, uh, bypass or PCI. And in that, we, we, we talked about clinicians and patients need to follow the familiar exhortation of legendary football coach Bill, Bill Belichick to do your job. That means we want to optimize lifestyle habits and use proven pharmacotherapy. So we really can uh, slow the progression of heart disease, in many cases, markedly lower the risk for heart attack and stroke. So these risk scores give us a broad range of risk. If you don't have any uh, risk enhancing factors, you move it further to the left. If you have no coronary calcium, it doesn't mean you never have an event over the next 15 years but your event rate's gonna be really, really low if you're a non-smoker. So this was a, a cool study that again, Quorum was a senior author, Mike Blaha, first author, where we looked at Paul Ritker's favorite biomarker, uh, HSCRP. And what we found head to head with a coronary calcium scan is that uh, the CRP had absolutely no prognostic significance if uh, you, you had the, the data from the coronary calcium scan. You could have a high CRP, but if you had no coronary calcium, your event rate was exceedingly low and, and vice versa. And this is just sort of showing here that uh, in individuals with uh, no coronary calcium, hardly any events over the next seven years, and almost all the coronary heart disease events were in those people who had at least moderate coronary calcium. So 75% of all the heart attack events and 60% of all the total CBD events occurred in those quarter of people with at least moderate coronary calcium. Now, a lot of people were saying, even last night, Christy Ballantyne said that, you know, sometimes he repeats a coronary calcium scan to help try to figure out if a person should be on aspirin. Maybe they had a low score before. But one of the things Mike Blaha and others have found is that, you know, these calcium scores go up exponentially. So if you had any coronary calcium by age 35, by age 50, on average, your score is going to be 100. And by age 60, it's going to be about 400. They go up exponentially. So if you find coronary calcium, there's really no need to, to do a serial um, study un unless you think it's going to motivate the patient to be uh, much more aggressive with their lifestyle um, factors. So let me quickly show you the article that was in our uh, uh, primary prevention guidelines more than any other cited by uh, Dr. Nasser, who you know, in our MESA um, uh, study, he wanted to say, how frequently do we find no coronary calcium? So in those people who we recommended statins uh, because they had a, a risk of seven and a half to 20%, 40% of those people had no coronary calcium. And if you looked at those borderline people and the consider 
statins and that five to seven and a half, it was nearly 60%. So that's where I got that 50% flip of the coin there. So really the ASCVD risk score leaves a lot to be desired. Now, if Christy were here, he'd probably be the, the person we could ask the most about polygenic risk scores and multiomics. When are they gonna be ready for prime time? Multiomics refers to the assessment of various metabolic markers, amino acids, lipids, et cetera, to create a, a more detailed uh, risk profile. But unfortunately, they're just not ready for prime time. And I think they may play a role in the future, but we're, we're waiting um, more standardization and greater availability of these uh, great tests. But right now, the best test we have to determine who's really at high risk is probably a coronary artery uh, calcium scan. Now, um, just across the street, uh, Miguel Cainsos Acherica worked with uh, Bill Zogby and, and Quorum Nasser, and they did a, a nice modeling study about trying to guide us about aspirin. Probably all of us in this room, age 45 and older, were wondering whether we should be taking aspirin. And what they were able to do, a really innovative analysis, was to say, well, if aspirin decreases events by about 12%, What's the number needed to treat and what's the number needed to harm to cause a major GI bleed? In that middle category, you see there that horizontal line of about 229, that's the number needed to harm over a five-year period from aspirin, but a high calcium score is more, much lower at around uh, 100. So that's why in certain guidelines, people have said, well, if you have moderate coronary calcium, you might consider aspirin in those individuals. Let's fast forward, we got through all the A's, I'm gonna quickly throw the B's, B for blood pressure. So uh, blood pressure has played a key role in world history. Here's a picture of FDR looking pretty young and vibrant there with Churchill and Stalin in, in 1943. And if you look back at FDR's medical history, you see when he was age 59 and in 1941, his blood pressures were 188 over 105 on average. That's when we had Pearl Harbor, U.S. declares uh, war. And then at age 62 in 1944, um, April 12th, he has a cerebral hemorrhage. His blood pressures were 240 over 130 and then had some readings the day he died of 260 over 150. He had a congestive heart failure and um, he was actually, his doctors restricted him from just to work only four hours a day, though he still had secret meetings with one of his uh, romantic uh, liaisons, uh, uh, Lucy Rutherford in uh, 1944. But clearly Stalin probably realized that FDR tended to be less sharp and faded as the day went on. And uh, Russia probably got more concessions than they, they probably should have uh, since FDR wasn't uh, uh, totally with it in 1944. So what do we need to know about blood pressure? Pretty straightforward, weight loss, health, healthy, health Heart healthy diet, cut back on sodium, increased physical activity, cut back on alcohol. Not much has really changed in blood pressure. Let's go see for cholesterol. Um, Brown and Goldstein uh, get the Nobel Prize uh, uh, work done in, in Dallas. We've had uh, such a amazing uh, contributions from them in the cholesterol era. And if I had to point one article for to get a good review, is this nice, nice New England Journal article that my colleagues Aaron Mikos and Bill McAvoy uh, led that is, is really such a, a superb uh, summary of risk assessment and lipid management. So um, when we presented the cholesterol guidelines, I said lower LDL is better with proven therapies. We're going to be aggressive, at least a 50% drop. And we wanted to, if our LDLs were above 70, we'd consider non-statins. And, and that was so important. And one of the non-statins was azetamibe. And it had a modest effect, about a 7% risk reduction. But the thing that I want to stress with you, if you look here, what were the event rates at six years? On well, the Simvastatin group, it was a 35% event rate. And if you added azetamibe, it goes down to 33%. So clearly, uh, a lot of work needs to be done, especially by the younger folks here, that we need to do a much better job uh, with atherosclerotic disease management. And we're here in Houston. Houston, you got to think Tony Gatto. This was a, a classic uh, cover from a cardiology world news. Uh, Jeremy Swan, we all used the Swan Gans catheter. He was a big cholesterol skeptic. He has, uh, his quote was the major effect of lowering cholesterol seen in patients with very elevated levels and known disease. But even here, the effect is small. 
And Dr. Gatto pointed to some data from Johns Hopkins precursor study. It said that the risk of a heart attack was five times as high for the men who had the highest cholesterol levels as compared to those who had the lowest. And, you know, Tony had a good sense of humor and he said, you know, people would say he's just part of the cholesterol mafia. And then he would say, well, with the name Antonio M. Gatto Jr., it made sense that I was part of the mafia. So he had a, a good sense of humor, but so much of, uh, of uh, what we've learned uh, comes from Tony Gatto's great work. So if you summarize a career in preventive cardiology, the 4S study, we had um, people whose LDLs at baseline were about 180. We drop it down to 120. We actually see a decrease in total mortality. And then you move ahead to the Fourier study, which used a PCSK9 inhibitor. And what you got to know about the PCSK9 inhibitor is that they lower the LDL about 50 to 60% more on top of what statin and azetamide can do. And I think that's uh, a, a very exciting. Now, nine months after we had our US guidelines, the European guidelines came out. And rather than 70, they talked about getting down to an LDL less than 55. They based that on the PCSK9 data. And they based on the fact that in the Improved study, they compared LDLs of 53 versus LDLs of, of 70. So for once, the Europeans were more aggressive than the Americans were. And what's come out since? Well, we have the bempedoic acid data and Christy ballantyne has been uh, very involved with that. And in primary prevention, in this analysis in, in JAMA by Steve Nissen, we could see that event rates went from about 7.5% to 5.5%, a 30% risk reduction. So that's pretty impressive. And I think a lot of us are, are using more bempedoic acid. Well, what's the future? Well, we have the monoclonal antibodies, antisense oligonucleotides, vaccination, gene editing, the young people in the audience. Uh, this is all stuff we would dreamed about 20 years ago. And now we're going to have uh, many more tools at our disposal. A lot of us are very interested in lipoprotein little a. We have to prove, though, the therapies that we have are safe and effective. And we also know that a high LPLA is associated with a much higher risk of developing aortic valve stenosis. Well, let me wind up with one of the controversies that I dealt with with my friend Rita Redberg. You may, you may re I recognize Golden Gate Bridge, San Francisco. Um, it goes back now, hard to believe, 2012, we, we debated one another in the Wall Street Journal, and we both looked a little bit younger there, but you'll notice that it said I was from John Hopkins. They always leave out the, uh, the S there. And, and Rita took this, the, the stance that statins should not be given to any, I mean, any primary prevention patients. Why? Because of side effects, no improvement in mortality, high cost, moral hazard, she said, excuse not to improve lifestyle. Now, you could say the same thing about a blood pressure medicine, a diabetes medicine, but she focused in on the, the cholesterol medicines. And then Mike Blaha, Quorum, and I debated uh, in JAMA about healthy men taking uh, statin medication. And uh, Rita worked with one of her deputy editors saying men should never take statins in primary prevention. And we were a little different than Rita. We actually used some actual data to support our work. This was supposed to be based on the JAMA editor at the time. It was 55, normal blood pressure, high total cholesterol. And I asked him what his HDL was and triglycerides. He said, oh, I'm a pediatrician. I don't know what my triglycerides or HDL uh, is. So just work with it. And what we were able to show is that you could actually get a better idea of the number needed to treat because if they, that person had no coronary artery calcium and you assumed that you could decrease events by 35%, you'd have to treat about 280 people. But if they had at least moderate coronary calcium, which was present in about 13% of the people his age, the number needed to treat was just about 45. And then it continued. Uh, we debated in this other ACC journal, and you'll get a kick out of this. They had a cartoonist, there's Rita, and she says statins are warranted strictly in secondary prevention, but are without evidence for use in primary prevention. She compared statins in primary prevention to opioids in patients with non-malignant pain or PPIs in persons with non-ulcer dyspepsia. Interesting. And then here's yours truly here. I said, with all due respect, that logic is as fractured and twisted as Joe Theismann's tibia and fibula after he met Lawrence Taylor in the Redskins backfield on Monday Night Football in 1985. 
After that, I don't think Rita spoke to me for the next three or four years, but um, I, I think it was a good graphic. And what Chris Cannon did, who was running uh, ACC.org then, is he actually linked um, our debate to the actual Monday night football of Joe Theismann having the, the broken leg. So it was interesting. And one of the things that, that I said is 99.9% .9 of cardiologists think about prescribing a generic statin to adults at increased risk. It's one of the certainties of life. It's like Billy Joel selling out the garden in less than an hour. Makes sense, inexpensive, but Dr. Redberg didn't believe it then, and I don't think she believes it now. So as preventive cardiologists, we have a number of people in the cath lab uh, here today. We think about lipid lowering as trying to stabilize uh, and reduce the size of that vulnerable plaque and, and thickening that fibrous cap so it's less likely to rupture. Now, a great quote here, a little break here. Dostoevsky said, the second half of a man's and presumably a, a woman's life is made up of nothing but the habits he or she acquired during the first half. And that's what the big challenge is for cardiologists. We really need the help of the primary care physicians to really motivate our patients better. Clearly, what we would say, more fruits, vegetables, increased fiber, less sugar, less saturated fat, more uh, regular fish intake. Now, the, the candidate for president didn't like that. He said, my sources tell me neither McDonald's French fries nor chocolate ice cream with rainbow sprinkles will make the AHA dietary recommendations. What a joke, sham, make junk great again. So you can't uh, please everybody, but uh, that was uh, his interpretation of the guidelines. Now, what about the new kid on the block, Ozempic? So we've seen this, you know, there's uh, Santa lost a little bit of weight here and we're looking and um, people uh, here are, are doing some cool stuff with whether it's Munjaro or Ozempic and looking at how it works. And there's an old car, uh, ad, some of you may remember, Betcha can't eat just one. That's the trouble most of us have when we take uh, chips or pretzels and we're hungry, we want to eat more and more. But things like taking those new weight loss medicines tend to dull the appetite. And uh, we're looking forward to what some of that data is. So as we wind up here, sodium, we want to cut that down as much as we can. This is probably the, the typical diet of the Texas Heart and the, the Baylor house staff and, and fellows. There we have pizza, sandwiches, cold cuts, soup, burritos, and tacos. Keep in mind that that's a really high sodium content, so watch your, your blood sugar. Now, for diabetes, it's not just what the glucose and A1C. We want to have a good tailored uh, nutrition plan, exercise. We want to set a goal, both in terms of weight loss, uh, exercise, as well as glycemic control. And uh, here's this great slide that, that Dr. Nasser put together with Miguel Canzo Sacherica, just illustrating how if we knew someone was really high risk, we might uh, uh, do different things in different people with diabetes. You may have the people whose A1C has been 6.7, 7.0 for a few years. That's a lot different than the person with worse glycemic control who already has end organ damage. The person who has more coronary calcification, you'll think more about a high intensity statin, other LDL lowering therapies, more apt to use aspirin, icosapentethyl, and also GLP-1 receptor agonists or SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, digital, D for digital health, David Feldman did one of the early studies showing that giving people feedback from apps or smart watches and things like that can motivate them to walk uh, one mile or more a day from what they otherwise would have done. You got, got to go back to Michael Jackson here. So exercise like Mike it can be dance, it can be basketball. We got to motivate our patients to do more. And we're also very in, involved at, at Hopkins and as, as a number of you are here in Houston about trying to do uh, remote cardiac rehab and using mobile health to do things. And now, um, Joe, we got a little bit of heart failure for you. We got uh, Clyde Yancey uh, there and we were on the court side of the game after ACC in Washington. And I show this uh, slide to emphasize to patients that the more risk, traditional risk factors you have, the higher you are at risk for heart failure. And we got to motivate our, our patients to do a better job on that. And I think um, so many times people just don't realize why did they get heart failure? But these are the same people that had all these traditional risk factors, overweight and not exercising. So this is what I want to leave you with. And this is probably the most important article that came out in circulation last year. It was all about the life lessons of Jackie Robinson. 
And Larry Sperling was the first author with Alex Rosavi. So Jackie Robinson, for those of you who don't know, was the first black person to play Major League Baseball, made his debut with the Dodgers at age 28. He was a champion for civil rights, pioneer in human dignity, and he faced tremendous discrimination on and off the field. Despite being an all-star pro athlete and the most valuable player in 1949, the end of his career and post-baseball life were affected by adverse cardiometabolic health and mental stress. After his first year, he gained 25 pounds. He didn't really give people good dietary advice. He was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes under the old definition at age 33. He would return to Georgia to bail out peaceful protesters, strong advocate for civil rights. For those of you who didn't know, he was a star athlete at, at UCLA, both basketball, track, and, and football. Here's a classic picture here of Jackie Robinson trying to steal home plate. Uh, he was ruled safe against Yogi Berra, the Yankees catcher. And while Jackie Robinson did have access to some medical care, his risk factors were largely untreated until the end of his career. And he uh, had an early passing in 1972 in Stamford, Connecticut, as home from sudden cardiac death. Clearly, uh, if he were alive, uh, it developed those risk factors now, we would be treating him a lot differently. But there's a lot of uh, data out there about the bio biology of adversity and social determinants of health that can lead to accelerated atherosclerosis and poor cardiometabolic outcomes. So what will we do differently now? Well, clearly statin therapy. We have GLP-1 receptor agonists, SGLT-2 inhibitors. If, if Jackie was unsure about going on medicine, we had coronary calcium as a tiebreaker. We have all this great data about lifestyle changes from the diabetes prevention program. This was a nice paper by Alex Razavi that showed that you have a much higher risk of sudden cardiac death the more calcification you have in your heart arteries. So Jackie uh, helped uh, equal the playing field for athletes of all backgrounds. But his own told story of premature cardiovascular disease is probably just as important as it emphasizes that preventive cardiology playing field continues to be inequitable throughout communities in the United States. And a great quote from Jackie Robinson, a life is not important except in the impact it has on other lives. And it really took... Um, Pee Wee Reese, who came from a really Southern prejudice background, put his arm around Jackie Robinson to, to uh, stop the barrage of racial slurs that were directed uh, to him by the Cincinnati fans. And for those of you who have a chance to read more about Jackie Robinson, it's a really inspiring story. So how am I going to tie this all back to where I started with, with uh, Spike Lee? Do the right thing. So this is a picture of my late mom, uh, Anita Blumenthal, at Harry Belafonte's 80th birthday party. One of the most fun events that I, I went to in my life, my wife decided not to go, brought my mom, there's Tony Bennett, there's, there's Harry Belafonte. And uh, life is a, a journey. Uh, Harry Belafonte came to see me because in New York, these interventionists wanted to start doing uh, some interventions on him, stenting and things like that. But he was the perfect example of the courage study, the ischemia trial, good medical and lifestyle management. He never needed revascularization. And then here's a, a cool picture of my, my son, Ross, playing uh, lacrosse, making a save against Villanova. Here's a nice pandemic picture of me pulling down my mask to voice my uh, disgust at the referee's fourth bath call in a row when we lost to uh, Notre Dame. But I uh, show this slide, teamwork makes the dream work. And so many of us uh, involved in the preventive cardiology community, it's really been a team effort. And whether we're in heart failure, whether we're in um, uh, EP, whether in the cath lab, we're all sort of a community and it really uh, is a, it's been fun to be a part of, uh, of the cardiology community. And this is the, the a picture that I always liked the most when <clears throat> my son uh, uh, won the conference championship as uh, the goalie there. So with that, I'll, uh, uh, I'll stop here and be happy to entertain questions. And thank you very much. It was a great honor to be here.